but Easter is almost here. Hi, FBC kids. I can almost see that Easter morning, early sunrise, sending sunlight and rays of hope into the darkness. Now, before we head into that glorious celebration, we must remember that the deepest, darkest, that Jesus had to go through the absolute pain and suffering for me, for you, and how that light of his love in the darkest moments never flickered out. Let's get started with some worship. I know a lot of us probably don't even want to admit this. Uh, it can be hard to be honest about this, but sometimes we cry. Sometimes it's because we are just so sad or frustrated. And other times it's because we are laughing so hard and having the best time that we are just crying in celebration. Now, sometimes we try not to cry. Sometimes we don't feel like it's the time or the place or we're with the people who can understand and, and hold that space for us. Even though we really, really want to let go of those emotions. We're going to talk about sadness today. So I want to know some of these things. And I want you to tell me if something might make you cry. Some of these scenarios, okay? Have you ever cried watching a sad scene in a movie? Did you ever have to move to a new town, a new home, a new space, a new school, and it just made you cry? Oh, you walked into the kitchen and someone was chopping onions. <laughs> okay, that's a silly one, but yes, it happens. Oh no, your best friend won't talk to you anymore. You have to go to the doctor and get a shot. Yuck. You lost a pet. Or your friend has lost a pet. You got in trouble because you made a big mistake. You got in trouble for no reason. 
Now, today's Bible story is when Jesus got in trouble for no reason. He took on a punishment for a crime he didn't do. But there was a really good reason he did this. And we're going to use the word suffer. It means to go through a tremendous amount of pain and hardship. There was a reason he had to suffer. But it wasn't because he did anything wrong, but because he loved us so very much. He was willing to pay for our wrongs. And that his love never flickered out. The light of Jesus never dimmed. But it was so awful that even Jesus cried out. Let's grab our Bibles and let's talk about the crucifixion. So I'm going to tell you a little something. Miss Julia cries every Easter. Every time we talk about the cross, every time we talk about the crucifixion, I cry about it. I might even cry today. Who knows? But I am so saddened by the pain that Jesus went through. But I also cry because I am so happy and thankful and relieved and blessed that Jesus died on the cross for me. That he didn't want me to go through all of that pain. He didn't want me to have to go through that sacrifice. And he loved me enough so many years before I was even born to make a plan for that forgiveness to get all the way to me. So I cry at Easter. Now let's talk about Jesus crying out. Now we've been talking about what we're going to call Holy Week. And it is the time between Easter Sunday, the Last Supper, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, crucifixion, and all the way to the resurrection. And today we're focusing on the crucifixion. Jesus dying on the cross. Now we talked about the Last Supper and Jesus being arrested. And before that took place, Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, what we celebrate as Palm Sunday. And the people gathered in the streets, they were waving palms, shouting Hosanna, and they were celebrating Jesus' triumphant entry into the city. They were celebrating Jesus. And yet not too many days later, others would stand at the foot of the cross and mock him and be celebrating his death. Now, they laid palms on the path for him to ride in on. They put their own cloaks and clothes down on the ground for him, and they made a path. They made this special area, this entrance for the celebration of the Hosanna in the highest. And then, I'll put those down there. We may need it later. <clears throat> then we have the Last Supper, where Jesus is preparing his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. And then we see that Jesus gets arrested because Judas did, in fact, betray him. And then we see many other moments where Peter denies that he even knew who Jesus was. And Jesus had told Peter, you're going to deny that you know me three times before the rooster crows. And we see in the scriptures all three times. And after that third time, the rooster crowed and Peter was devastated. And he was broken down that he had done exactly what Jesus had said and denied him even though he promised to love him and never forsake him. He had. And Jesus still loved and never forgot Peter. So <clears throat> we're going to read a couple of different things, but like I said, Jesus is betrayed and arrested. Peter denies he even knew Jesus because then after Jesus was arrested, they went after the disciples. Jesus' trial before Pilate, which we talked about last week, where they screamed, crucify him, crucify him, and they stirred up the crowd. <sighs> And they said, crucified him. Why? 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 I've now found no reason, Pilate kept telling them. I don't know why. Flog him and release him. But they shouted louder and louder for Jesus to be crucified. And Pilate sentenced Jesus to die as they demanded. Now, <clears throat> other gentlemen, there are two other men that will end up on the crosses next to Jesus. And they're going to be a little bit part of our story as well. But... Jesus is led away, and he is beaten and broken. And we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 49. And I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Are you ready? Two others, both criminals, were led to be executed with him. And when they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled. For his clothes by throwing dice and the crowd watched and the leader scoffed he saved others they said he saved others let him save himself if he really is God's Messiah the chosen one 
And the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. And they called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above his head with these words. And it says, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. And us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God, even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm going to pause for just a second because a lot more happens and I want to talk about it first. Okay, the time had come. For God's son, Jesus, to die on the cross. And up until now, he had done nothing wrong. But those religious leaders and Pilate and the crowd were demanding his death, his crucifixion. And if that wasn't enough, not only before he was nailed to the cross, Jesus was humiliated and beaten and just whew, attacked. I told you I might cry. Jesus was nailed to the cross like a common criminal. And even as he was there dying, people gathered to watch, and they divided up his clothes, and they mocked him for not being able to save himself. <sighs> Jesus knew this was the plan. It was the purpose for why he came. But he still felt every inch of his body screaming in agony. He felt every drop of blood. He felt the crown of thorns pushed into his skull. He felt the flogging. He felt the pain excruciating. He was betrayed and despised by the very crowd who had heralded his entry, waving palms in the air. The very city that laid their clothes and cloaks on the ground to welcome him in had turned on him. He was hurting so much. But in a different part of the Bible, where we see this story again in another gospel, Jesus cried out to God because he felt that pain in isolation. And then there were other criminals on the cross next to him. There's one on the right, one on the left, and there was one who mocked him again. Dying next to him, being put through the same punishment, he felt the need to mock Jesus. Cannot imagine. But the other one, he understood Jesus and his purpose and the offering of forgiveness that he had. And when he cried out to Jesus, Jesus answered and he promised him, you will be with me in the kingdom. Even in the darkest moment, we're going to see even more darkness is coming, sadly. Jesus offered that hope and that light and that forgiveness. The man was dying on the cross for crimes he committed and called out for forgiveness. And it was there for him, no matter what. <sighs> okay, I'm ready. Verses 44 through 49. Okay. <laughs> By this time, it was about noon, which is middle of the day. And darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. And the light from the sun was gone. And suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last and when the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and he said, Surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd came to see the, the crucifixion, saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. I told you I was going to cry. <laughs> so a couple of things now happened. Darkness fell over the day. Now we have a solar eclipse coming and you probably heard a lot of people talk about how the moon's going to pass over and there's going to be darkness and it's going to last for a couple of minutes especially in certain parts of the world it's going to be darkest for the longest time but nothing is going to compare to three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. It's like creation was crying out in the same moment that darkness was prevailing. And then, this is one of my favorite things, there's a curtain in the temple, and it was to kind of section off an area that was meant to go for the priest to interact with God. It was this holy space. And the Bible tells us that it was torn 
down the middle. Now this curtain was extremely large. You couldn't reach the top of it. it. You would have had to have ladders and scaffolding and a bunch of people involved to reach the top. And it didn't say that somebody tore the curtain. It said that the curtain in the temple was torn down the middle. Not up to the top, down. It's like it came from heaven. Jesus cried out to God one last time before he died. And we know that God heard Jesus' cry. Why? Because this is not the end of the story, which is why I'm crying. Because I love that this is just one step to what we get to celebrate next week. This is the beginning. And even though Jesus had to die, it was the plan. It was his sacrifice. He was willing and able to do it. And he chose to do it. God is going to do something just three amazing days later but we're going to learn about that next week. So you have to come back and visit us. And the way that we experience pain and sadness, whew, it's not like Jesus did, is it? We're very thankful and fortunate that we don't have to go through the pain and suffering that he did. But it doesn't mean that our pain and suffering isn't serious, and that it doesn't hurt, and that we have to ignore God in those moments. We can cry out just like Jesus did, and it shows us that in the darkest of hours, who we turn to, the light that we search for is God because he never leaves us or forsakes us and he forgets that sin that's forgiven. He did not leave Jesus. He did not forget Jesus. And even though it melt, might have felt like darkness was everywhere on that day, the sun literally stopped shining. It was covered. It was gone, that light. It doesn't leave forever. It's not gone forever. And our sadness and our mourning, it's there. We get to feel those things, but God never leaves us in it. And we're going to talk about how God hears our cries just like he heard Jesus's on the cross. Let's play a little emotions game. I know you guys probably know what emojis are. They're the little icons on our computers and our tablets and our everything that kind of make a little face about how we're feeling, right? I use emojis. I'm kind of that person. I like my emojis. My favorite one is the crying tilted face one. Um, but I want to know what kind of face you can actually make when you're feeling a bunch of different things. So I'll tell you some emotions and I want to see your faces and how you're feeling, okay? Angry. Oh, I'm angry. Okay, what about happy? Happy, happy, happy. I tend to dance when I'm happy too. What about scared? I can show you a lot of Disney roller coaster pictures where I am scared. Okay, what about tired? Oh my goodness, was I tired this week? And I just, oh, I felt it in my shoulders and my arms. It just dragged me down. Excited. What about an excited face? Again, I do a little wiggle when I'm excited. I can't contain it. I'm so happy. Sad. That's when I feel in my shoulders too. Doubt, confused, questioning. Is, is it? What about pain? Mm, I'm a big wimp, so my pain is all over my face. Ow, it hurts. God doesn't mind it when we show our emotions. He wants to hear what's going on with us. He wants to know how we're feeling and what we're thinking. He wants us to talk to him. Every single type of emotion, he's always listening, and he wants us to share how we're feeling. We talked about a lot of different emotions, but when are sometimes we might be feeling some of these emotions? When are you excited? When are you in pain? I hope not a lot. That would be, that would be hard. What about happy? What about angry? Whew. Sometimes I get angry when um, I put like, I just put washer fluid, windshield wiper fluid in my car like a month ago. And all of a sudden the car started beeping at me again that it needed more. I think there's a leak. But I'm just like, I just put some in you. Stop whining at me. Makes me a little grumpy. Now, we were created to have all kinds of emotions, and we're created in God's image. So we know that God's feeling a lot of these things too. But God is with us all of the time. He understands when we're happy and when we're sad. And we can go to God with anything and everything, and he hears our laughter, and he hears our screams, and he hears our questions, and he hears our... Whew. 
Sorry, I think that was two in one. He hears our yawns as well. And God hears our cries, just like he heard Jesus' on the cross. This month, we're memorizing Psalm 27, 1a, and it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? In the sense of whom shall I fear, I'm also thinking of what shall I fear. Darkness doesn't last forever. Jesus' death on the cross is not going to last even more than three days. And we're going to talk about that next week. So come back. I can't. I'm probably going to cry again. It's going to be so fun. So who cried out things to Jesus like, save yourself if you're really the king? Who cried out to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Who cried out to God, in your hands I commit my spirit? I actually have something. We're going to go to Psalm 31, verses 14 through 16 in just a second. But I want you to think of this question while I'm reading the Psalms. How can you tell that the writer of that Psalm knew that God hears our cries? So when we read that in just a second, I want you to think about how the psalmist, that's the author of it, it's not his name, it's just what we call a person who writes a psalm, hears our cries. And other times I would like to know, when are times that you feel sad, worried, or other big emotions? What are some things that we can say to God in those moments? How can we cry out to God? How do you think crying out to God can help you when things are tough? Do you think it brought Jesus comfort on the cross to know that God was with him? Do you think we can feel that same comfort knowing that God is with us? I think so too. Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to Psalm 31, verses 14 and 16. So I grabbed my Bible and I started to read and I was just like, nope, I think we need more than just 14 through 16. So we're going to back it up all the way to 9, okay? But keep in mind, how do we know that God hears our cries? Verse, starting in verse 9. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in distress. Tears blur my eyes. My body and soul are withering away. I am dying from grief. My years are shortened by sadness. Sin has drained my strength. I am wasting away from within. I am scorned by all my enemies and despised by my neighbors. Even my friends are afraid to come near me. When they see me on the street, they run the other way. I am ignored as if I were dead, as if I were a broken pot. I've heard the many rumors about me, and I am surrounded by terror. My enemies conspire against me, plotting to take my life. Here are the verses I wanted to talk about, though. But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God. My future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine on your servant. In your unfailing love, rescue me. Oh, there's so many more good verses in here. So if you have a few minutes with your family, go read Psalm 31. There, oh, it's beautiful to know that when we started the scripture, okay, that first half of talking about like sadness and feeling alone, being in physical pain, feeling like we were dying from this grief, we felt those emotions. I don't know if you felt that such extreme, but we felt that sadness and that alone before. We felt physical pain as well, and even Jesus felt these emotions. In fact, they're so common. I'm sorry, I'm getting goosebumps from talking about this. <laughs> these emotions are so common that there's a word for it. It's called lament. It's kind of a prayer or a truth-telling that admits that we're sad and we need God. Jesus lamented. Old prophets, they wrote laments. And even today, we can lament when we wish that the situation was better than it is. I want to read verse 14 just, just one more time. Okay. <clears throat> but I am trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God. The writer of this psalm is crying out to God, and it sounds different than Jesus crying out to God. Does it? Is it the same? Do we cry out to God in all circumstances? But why is he crying out to God? Oh, is it because God hears our cries? because he's always listening for us, because he never leaves us or forsakes us, is because 
we can be still and know that he is God, that we can be strong and courageous with him on our side. For he is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? Is it because he's the God of the universe who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to, for our sins so that we might be saved if we ask for that gift of salvation? Is it because he loves us so very much that Jesus was willing to go through incomparable pain, suffering, and sadness so that that broken relationship with God could be restored through him. Goosebumps! I'm so excited for Easter! <sighs> Let's pray before we close. Heavenly Father, I am speechless in awe of your gift of Jesus for us, Lord, that you would willingly subject your son for me, for us, for your children and your creation. Lord, thank you for this gift. Thank you, Jesus for dying on the cross, for willing to submit your spirit and your body to such pain and agony for my sins. That pain was mine and not yours, and I thank you for hurting on my part. God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for these kids and their family. I thank you that we get to celebrate this season together because we have a Savior who loves us this opportunity, this moment to not live separate from you, but to be restored in our relationship, to be your children, to have our name written in the book. Lord, I pray for these kids and their families. Help us to celebrate the joy of the season, the gift of your Savior. Help us to take it with us every day forward, that we never forget your forgiveness that we live our lives shining like a city on a hilltop, a bright beacon of hope and light in our city and our homes and the lives of those around us, Lord, that we shine for you just as Jesus was the light in the very darkest of moments. God, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for this facility. I thank you for the people that come in and out every single day. And Lord, I pray for those that will be celebrating Easter season with us, Lord. I ask that you draw us closer to one another, that our eyes and our ears are open for the needs and the pain and the struggling of those around us, Lord, that we can shine God's light in those moments. And we can remind the others, Lord, that you hear our cries and you never leave us or forsake us. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. It's Easter season, and I'm so excited. This is my happy face. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.